Our initial benchmarking of the AMD RX 5700X TGPU had one primary complaint, and that was, predictably, the blower cooler. We typically do hybrid mods, where we stick a liquid cooler on a GPU to improve it, but this time we decided to do something simpler and replace the Hitachi HMO3 thermal pad with four cents worth of washers and some thermal paste. Then we made an additional change after that and added some thermal pads to the backplate for some A-B testing. This data shows how much of an improvement you can get with better mounting pressure on the GPU and with some new thermal paste rather than the thicker and more thermally inefficient thermal pad. With our quick changes, we were able to get the card into a 40 dBA operating range without thermal throttling, which was not possible previously on our test bench. Before that, this video is brought to you by Corsair's Iron Claw RGB wireless gaming mouse. The Corsair Iron Claw focuses first on comfort with its palm grip approach and also uses a sub one millisecond wireless connection for the PC. You can toggle between wireless and Bluetooth connectivity, making it easy to control multiple PCs with one mouse, like a streaming PC and a gaming PC. The mouse has 10 programmable buttons, the PMW3391 18,000 DPI sensor, three zone RGB LEDs, and 50 million click lifespan for left and right mouse buttons. Learn more at the link in the description below. We've done this before with AMD cards. We did it with Vega in more depth with 56 and 64, and that was primarily because with HBM, they had different packaging methods where some of the packaging would have uh, an epoxy resin on it and some of it wouldn't. And so that changed the mounting contact to the HBM and the GPU from the vapor chamber. With Radeon 7, we did some of this, and this is just pressure testing with pressure paper. We would secure it, remove it, secure it again, and did that three passes for these. And the end result was that the entire middle never really made contact with the vapor chamber until you put that Hitachi thermal pad on there, which is what Andy's using for these cards instead of thermal paste. So there's some ups and downs to this. The positive side is that thermal pads like the Hitachi pad or like uh, some of the other more permanent thermal pads in the market, like Carbonaut or something like that, the advantage to them is that they age well in that they don't really age like thermal paste. A lot of paste will cure, not all of it does, but a lot of it does cure over time and become worse over time. So that's the upside. The downside is that all of these solutions and including Carbonaut, uh, they are not as thermally effective as a good thermal paste. And so much of this comes down to things like well, one of it is the, the properties of the material, but another one is the thickness of the material. With thermal paste, you can smash it down tighter, and that Hitachi HMO3 pad is pretty damn thick. So that does impact the cooling capabilities in a negative way. Now, the upside is that AMD can try to solve some of the mounting pressure issue, which we've tested again. The first thing we did after getting all the thermal testing done was take the thing apart and put some pressure paper on it. And lo and behold, the top one here, which we'll show in B-roll, the top one is the original test, then the bottom one is the uh, test where we applied some washers to it. So this is the simplest thing we did to fix our Radeon 7 card too, is uh, we put four of these on here. These just come with radiator screws. You can get them for about a penny each at your local hardware store. Uh, for reference, these are one millimeter thick. We might recommend something a little bit thinner, maybe more like if you can find them 0.5 or 0.7 millimeter thick washers. We went with metal because they were around. Plastic would be a little safer because then you'll crack the washer before you cause damage to the hardware, in theory, anyway. So metal and a little bit th uh, thicker is what we use, but we'd probably recommend plastic and a bit thinner, just so you have some more play there to, to damage the washer before you damage anything else, because then it would be the weakest link. It's just a safety measure. But uh, anyway, the point is we put some of those on with Radeon 7, and we were able to get paste working, where previously, when we, because of this, when we installed Radeon 7 with thermal paste and without any extra mounting pressure from uh, washers under the four screws on the retention plate, it made worse contact than the HMO3. And so the HMO3 thermal pad was better in those scenarios. But with the extra mounting pressure, the thermal paste is better. So uh, we applied that here too, and we've improved it quite a bit for just the blower cooler alone to the point where we can now run at a lower noise level uh, while operating at slightly lower temperatures as well and no longer throttle. Previously, we were thermal throttling on the frequency at 40 dBA, and we've now fixed that. So while this shot of the pressure papers on the screen, a couple things, if it's a, a brighter or more saturated red, that means there's better contact in that area. If it's not red or there's, it's not quite as saturated, that means there's worse contact. And we see a gap exists in the center for both tests, even with the washers, which would indicate uh, one of two things, either a lack of mounting pressure in the center of the cooler, which kind of makes sense because there's no screw there since the GPU is there, or it could also mean 
that there is a, uh, a bump in the surface of the vapor chamber, like a non-levelness, which would also make sense for a vapor chamber. And in our original Radeon 7 testing, you can see that there's a similar pattern that emerges, and we think that is probably from where the, uh, the vapor chamber might have some cylinders or different support, we're not quite sure, but it's a level levelness issue in the cold plate. Before I get into the testing data here, it's, it would probably be good to talk about thermal conductivity as a rating. So there's different ways to measure thermal conductivity. A lot of the manufacturers do it in different ways. You often, one pace to the next, you can't just straight compare the thermal conductivity number. Sort of like how with fan CFM, if it's not tested the same way from one manufacturer to the next, there's no industry standard that these companies adhere to. If you're not comparing to like for like, then the numbers aren't necessarily directly comparable. And that's true for thermal conductivity especially. So when you see a really high thermal conductivity rating on these Hitachi thermal pads, just because that number is higher than what you would get on what we used, which we used a, hydronaut, a thermal grizzly hydronaut paste, and I'll link them in the description below um, if they're not already an ad for this video, they might be. But we used a hydronaut paste, and that's fairly high thermal conductivity, but the Hitachi pad is higher. But it's not, Hitachi pad's higher, therefore is better, because there's also the thickness of the material, um, and then things like orientation on those pads matter too, vertically, uh, they, they transfer the most efficiently, which these are oriented that way. But yeah, so that's, I wanted to point that out. You can't just look at thermal conductivity between two, property, two, two products and determine if one is better than the other without any further information. Let's get into the test data for this. We are looking at GPU junction and GPU edge temperature. The edge temperature is the standard one. That's what NVIDIA measures presently or presents anyway. The junction temperature is the hottest of all the sensors on the die. From memory, Vega or Radeon 7 had 64 of those, I think. And we're not sure how many 5700 XT has, but it takes the hottest one and then boosts according to that temperature. 110 is TJ Max, or at least the maximum temperature at which it will begin to uh, throttle. And then with Radeon 7, it went up with overclocking. Not sure if it's supposed to with this one, though. So 110 is the max for junction. We're also measuring VRM and the memory temperatures for this, too. So, uh, And then finally, we have a backplate test where we put some thermal pads on the backplate to see if it improves the VRM or memory thermals. It would probably not improve the GPU thermals, as you'll see here. And then that was done without even needing to repaste the card. So we could do those tests back to back because all that comes off is the backplate, all the other screws remain in. So that makes it really easy to compare without even having to repaste, which would throw another variable at it. And then finally we did um, for, so at, well, we'll talk about this more later, but we did uh, an average of three different test passes for each configuration for the final chart that you'll see. That way we can eliminate some run to run variants and ambient temperature was controlled and monitored every second. So let's get into it for this benchmark. We retested the thermals of the RX 5700 XT at 40 dBA. The RX 5700 XT's blower cooler proved problematic for our initial testing where a 40 dBA fixed noise level resulted in a GPU junction temperature of about 110 to 112 degrees Celsius which bounces off the throttle point. The GPU edge temperature was about 94 degrees compared to an NVIDIA 2070 Super FE card's edge temperature of about 67 degrees. You can see that chart on the screen already, hopefully. And that'll be the previous chart we showed in our review. So no new data here yet. The bigger problem was that the GPU junction temperature, as that's uh, where throttling will start. And we also noted that we ran these tests in something of an ideal environment in that initial review, which is a low ambient of 21 to 22 degrees Celsius, whereas most modern cases will sit at an ambient of at least 30 degrees Celsius, especially if the CPU is under load, if you have a case with a solid front panel. But fortunately, those don't exist. You never see those. And uh, also, if you don't run AC or something. In our new testing, we found GPU edge temperature to plot at about 86 degrees in this chart. That's a drop of 8 degrees Celsius in our controlled testing environment. This is with the ambient unchanged and logged again second to second during the run with the fan speeds controlled to 40 dBA. An 8 degree reduction in edge temperature from just adding paste and washers is a massive change for minimal effort. Again, it's about 4 cents of washers, and if you buy some good paste, it's maybe another 10 bucks or so. As a plug, we did use our GN Teardown Toolkit and had the cooler off in about five minutes in the second time we did this, replaced the paste, and had it all back together and working in under half an hour. So this is a pretty easy mod. The first time you do it, it might take 40 minutes or so. And you can grab our toolkit if you want it on store.cameraznexus.net. It has every tool you need for this video card. As for the GPU junction temperature, we improved that from 110 degrees to one. 
uh, 12 degrees previously throttling down to 103 degrees Celsius. It's also a major improvement and means we're no longer clock throttling at 40 dBA. Technically, this comparison isn't even one to one because the throttling clocks previously meant that we didn't know what the true uninhibited temperature would have been if it hadn't throttled. It would have been higher though. As for the memory and the MOSFETs in the new chart here, our memory temperatures were originally at about 98 degrees Celsius at 40 dBA, which is at a point of spec limitations for GDDR6. It's, it's fast approaching that, uh, that limit where GDDR6 is operating outside of the recommended temperature. The change improved memory thermals for two reasons. One, we've increased mounting pressure of the cooling unit. We can put a shot up of our teardown where we show how the cold plate comes into contact with the memory indirectly via base plate. And the second reason is that we're increasing the cooling efficiency and getting heat away from the GPU faster, which will reduce heat in the vicinity of the memory. Back to the chart, VRM MOSFET temperatures have remained mostly the same, which makes sense. These components are farther from the GPU socket and are heat synced into the base plate directly. The improvement is maximally two to three degrees Celsius, which is outside of our error margins, but not particularly noteworthy. As for whether adding pads to the back plate helps, we have an easier chart to look at for that. The answer is that it's more or less as expected. We saw no reduction in GPU temperature, which makes sense since all the heat is for the GPU is far from the back plate, would have to go through multiple layers of uh, substrate, dye, uh, copper, and gold, and then the, the PCB eventually. So that makes sense to not see a difference there. We saw a reduction of about two degrees on the VRM MOSFETs, and this is after accounting for the ambient again. And these results are, as a reminder, an average of three task passes on each configuration, which is why you're seeing this chart instead of over time. That's a total of six task passes uh, between these two. Thermal paste was able to be left for each pass because only the backlight is removed, which means that the cooler itself can stay mounted with the same paste. After all that testing, we end up with an average improvement of about two degrees in the memory and the VRM thermals, which in the sake of the, the memory is actually somewhat important because it's already running so hot. With VRM, it doesn't matter that much, but it is an improvement. So as for whether this is worth it, well, it really depends. First of all, we would recommend waiting for partner models if you're buying this card because those will, in most cases, solve the problem without needing extra work and will be better anyway. They'll, this is still, it's still loud and it still runs hot. It's just, it's a lot better. So a partner model will still be better than this. If you are buying one of these though, and you are leaving the reference cooler on it, then it might be worth doing the washer mod with thermal paste. The or even without thermal paste, you could still improve it a bit. The downside is, there are a couple downsides. One, if you remove this cooler and you're not just adding washers, you could add washers without removing the cooler, in which case you don't damage the thermal pad. If you remove the cooler, there's a good chance you damage the thermal pad, at which point you're going to have to use paste. And so then you lose the uh, advantage of a thermal pad, which is not really subject to the same aging as a lot of the pastes are, but you can counter that by using a non-curing paste and again, uh, we used Hydronaut here, but we'd probably recommend Cryonaut. That one lasts more or less forever. It, it'll last the life of the card, uh, at least from our experience. So if you use a non-curing paste like that, you'll be in good shape. But still, you're, you're modifying the device, uh, and if you're not experienced opening it, then that could be a downside. It's not difficult. Of course, you can watch our video to see how it's done. It's very easy, a couple screws and some cables. Um, increasing the pressure, is something we're a little uncertain about. If you're careful with it like we were and you don't over torque things, then it should be fine. If you over torque it or you use a washer that is a little bit too thick and you have to really drive that screw into the, into the threads, there's a chance you could cause damage to the PCB or the GPU. So be careful if you do this mod. It's not difficult. Uh, there is an improvement. We would say overall it's worth it. It's just because of how many people watch these videos and the skill level of all of the people watching varies greatly. I do want to be very clear that if you have no experience working with stuff like this, uh, it is not hard. I don't want to make it sound too difficult. It's just be careful because if you over torque things, what, so an example of what can happen is if you have like, uh, because this happened to me, if you have, the cooler not line up perfectly when you get this fan back in there, it's got a triangular plate that sits in the base plate. And if that triangle is not inserted into the other triangle and it's out of place, what'll happen is to use a cane pin quote, the PCB will bend like a banana when you try to put it back together and you'll get a, a really nasty bend in it. And if you 
screw all the screws back in in that st that state, it will probably damage the card. Uh, if you catch it, you'll be fine. But anyway, yeah. The point is, this is not difficult, and uh, it's certainly easy for anyone to do. We just want to make really clear for people who are inexperienced to watch out for that kind of thing because. Um, this is something that I would expect more people will do as a mod because it's so trivial. It's a couple washers. So again, the final recommendations. We used a one millimeter thick uh, steel washer and that worked fine. Just kind of watch the torque on it. Used a cryo or a hydronaut paste. Would recommend a cryonaut paste or something similar. And for your uses, I'd probably recommend a plastic washer that's a little bit thinner. 0.7 would be ideal. Not sure if you can really find those, but um, and then that that would be a pretty good safety check too. So anyway, that's it for this one. There's an improvement that's worthwhile. And the reason it's worthwhile is because we went from 40 dBA and throttling, which is not a, a really a valid use because now you have to increase the fan temperature so you're not throttling. We went from that to 40 dBA and not throttling so you can actually use the card at 40 dBA as tested 20 inches away because that's important in a room with a noise floor of about 26 dB. So yeah, worthwhile if you feel like opening it up uh, for the thermal improvement. And I think that'll wrap it. So that fixed a lot of the problems with the cooler in terms of not throttling while being a reasonable temperature. We'd like to see AMD do this instead, because then you can, I mean, then it comes from the factory that way. My assumptions would be that they think the mounting pressure issue is best solved by a thermal pad rather than by finding a new retention system because maybe uh, when you're mass producing thousands of these it maybe it becomes an issue of you could I don't know over tighten or something like that if it's all done by machine and there's some variance not really sure what the exact reasoning is but that'd be my assumption thank you for watching you can go to store.gamersaccess.net if you'd like to pick up a toolkit like this one which is what we use for this modding again it has every tool you'll need for this uh, once you're experienced with it, it takes about five minutes to take it apart and put it back together minus the pasting time. And you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out there as well. I'll see you all next time.